second question is from Barry. Uh, does any member have a process to remove extremely dark entities from homes? Barry, is this a, with particular reference to a, a, an issue that you were dealing with? Uh, last few days, I was um, asked to have a look at a house uh, in a place called Mackay, where I sometimes live. And um, this guy, his wife was having uh, emotional problems. She's very moody. And uh, he said that when she they go holidaying on the, in their caravan, as soon as he gets away from the house, she's, she's really good. So I thought I'd do a, uh, I did a remote there, was, and I was getting that there was, there was about four entities in the place, and uh, but two particularly really you know, bad ones, and which had come in with one of, well, I found out later, I worked out that it was one of her sons was um, into all sorts of, uh, you know, probably drugs, uh, seemed to be one of the catalysts. So I went in and uh, I'd marked where, which bedrooms they were. I went in and um, the, there was two, if you say, uh, two entities that had been there for a long time, which weren't a problem. But the other two were in, one was in the office, one was in the bedroom. So I went in and, and um, went to them and, and they weren't, they were, uh, well, I, I don't know how you rate them, but they, they weren't. I would use the term demonic, but they were, they were pretty heavy duty, and I think they attached to the woman, um, and especially if she's a bit down in her moods, and uh, so definitely affecting their this couple's relationship. So the lady didn't know I was doing this, but um, I'm going. It's only a couple of days ago, so I'm waiting to hear the results whether it makes a change. But uh, so. I just, I guess the question is uh, how any of um, the DIAs has handled that. I, the way I do it, I just, in those cases, I just go to a track. My, da my pendulum it swings really um, wildly. And then I just work with my thoughts and uh, ask them to leave and do a prayer, uh, different techniques. And then, as the, the pendulum gradually slows down and goes to a dead stop, and uh, then I ask whether it's been cleared. So uh, this appears to have happened. I'll, I'll probably go back and check again sometime, but but I'm just wondering what uh, other people, or how other people handle a situation like that. Yeah. Uh, interesting, interesting stuff. I, I, I myself would uh, I look at it from two points of view. Look at it from the the lady's vibration and the vibration of the of the home itself. Um, and uh, you know, I with the with the entity things for me, I think it's really important not to get too caught up in the idea of of how you know how bad an entity is you know it's look at it through or i've looked at it through vibration so it's either a low vibration or it's a normal vibration or a high vibration so when we use the biometer we we're, we're not going into that place in our mind because the minute we go into that place in our mind you know if it's a it's an extra heavy or demonic uh, entity we start to put pressure, we're, we're, we're giving energy to the entity. And so we want to keep it just light. I, that's, that's, my, that's my take on it. So just, just looking at the vibration of the, of the house, the vibration of the lady and altering both uh, would, would be how I would deal with, the, with that, that situation. Mary's got a hand up, uh, George. Hi, Mary. There we are. 
Rosemary's probably not going to want to admit to having had a lot of experience in this, but both of us have. There's a lot of a lot to be said for what you just said, George, about not getting too into it. But I think you have to have some clarity about these things. They've come from somewhere. So have a look at where they've come in and how they've come in, because that might be an open door to other things coming in. So you're not just dealing with what's there then. You want to look how it got there. And it can get there because people are ill or they're mentally disturbed or they can get in because there's some kind of weakness because um, there's uh, ley lines or there's been new development or they can come in through curses. Curses are much more common than people realise. And they can be intergenerational and people can have them put on remotely as well. So you can get curses going back hundreds of years and they'll affect only the men or only the women or only the eldest child in the family or things like that. And it could be a repeated pattern. So look how it came in, try and work out what it is and then try and work out where it's got to go because things don't just disappear you know it's a bit like throwing your rubbish out through the kitchen window and thinking it's okay you've got it out the house but it's not okay so you need to think what kind of an entity is this and where does it need to go next because if it's mischievous or negative it needs to go to be re-educated if it's downright demonic and really bad i always go to the top man and i always say um, in the name of Jesus Christ, be bound, be gone. And then I'll let, you know, let the top man deal with it. Or I use some of the higher powered angels from time to time because they've got to go somewhere. You know, if you get them out of one place, they'll, as it says in the Bible, they go around like a raging lion seeing whom they may devour. So, you know, just clearing them from where you are doesn't work. Um Anything you'd like to add, Rosemary? You're the, the master at all this. I don't know about that, but we find it best to work in a group. Yes. Really, because two or th ideally three, but two and, and, and the person involved, there's real power in a group of three. Absolutely. And also, no one can see the back of their own head, you know? So we cover different angles. Yeah. So between us, we can actually get a huge amount done. And Paul Marrow was called in the other day to look at someone. We were kind of rubbing our, you know, kind of what, what's going on here. And we call her Mrs. Velcro now, because if Mary's around, you can guarantee that whatever it is will jump from wherever they are onto her. Hmm. <laughs> Which I'm means that these, like a, these ones that are like the, paper. the intermittent um, kind of then, then are, are stuck for a little while and we can actually get a handle on them. Um, but yeah it's a question of just talking with them really or, or trying to getting them open to talk yeah. with them because most of them are not really dark mm. they're in the wrong place they've got stuck a lot of them are just frightened um they're drawn to other people who have a similar sort of emotion if they have an emotion if they if something happened to them in their life and they were you know upset or angry or fearful or whatever they will be drawn to that Others do come along ley lines and come out, and we're finding increasing a lot of people from off planet, ETs kind of being drawn out in. I was going to ask a question actually at one point and see if anyone was interested in looking at electromagnetic vibrations and what are those that are coming in now, because we're suddenly exposed to so many new ones, but I'll keep that for and on. Um, but yeah, there's no rule of thumb. Basically, we just try and help them, talk yes. with them, yeah, and yeah. and ask the angels i mean christopher was a great one for having angels in and we, we learned that one that from him really to call the angels in and uh, there have been a couple of angels when we've had to ask the angels to actually take them and bind them and take them to wherever clinic or whatever that they need to go for re-education and, and you know whatever but not here thank you very much you know but many of them just go through to the light after they've come after they've talked a bit and calm down and understand what's what's happened i mean you tell them what the year is now and a flock of them are quite kind of shocked because <laughs> they haven't realised they're kind of in limbo and they just kind of recircle their life going round and round, as it were, um, trapped. And, and it's not actually, it can't be very nice for them. Yeah. One thing you know, so, that, so we talk with them, basically. Yeah. 
find out about them, find out what we can do to help. What I would add is you must be absolutely fearless when you deal with this sort of thing. Um, again, I, I refer to the Bible a lot. Um, you'd never guess I'd got a disclaimer in divinity, would you? Um, perfect love casts out fear. Yeah. So if you go in and you have love, it makes you invulnerable. Um, it always makes you invulnerable if you have love. Um, but if you're at all tentative or unsure, please don't get there. Because you have to get in with this stuff, like Muhammad Ali getting over the ropes. Um, if you're not, if you haven't got that sort of "I'm the boss of this" confidence, you can be spiritually overpowered by these things, and it's not a good place to be. Um, that, that's all I'd say is, and if you're not sure, um, deal with them with one or two more experienced people. You might get one negative entity that manifesting that as soon as you start opening the space you'll get a whole load of stuff that they have. It, might be, it might be damaging to your mental health let's put it that way if you um if you get the wind up Just agree with that rosemary yeah and there are occasions when i've had to go to, to people i know to say look can you help me with this because i don't know that i can do it certainly not on my yeah. own you know yeah, yeah, always ask, mm. always do the permission. So always check. Wow. And you could always yeah. browse, you know, yourself first to say, you know, have I got the capability to do this on my own? Is it better for me to call somebody else in, you know, and, and, and find out? Absolutely. And we're all in a learning journey, so, mm. hey, hey, great. Yeah, I mean, and also you working a doctor, with... you go to a specialist, don't you? So yeah. you wouldn't just go to your GP if you need a kidney transplant, definitely. So if before you start to work with these things, just do the permissions and say, can I may or should, or is it right for me to deal with this? And if it isn't right, ask if it's right for you with other people. And if it's still not, then just don't go there. Because there are basic not, rules, but basic. often things are very individual, Barry. So, you know, you, you kind of have to see what's best for that situation at the time. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, you gradually build up a list of questions because really a good dowse is only good as the questions they ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. David's got We're always coming up with new questions. Yes, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll mute myself. There we go. I, I would do Hello. That's helpful. Hi. <laughs> Who wants to talk next? Sorry, I'll go after you, David. Oh, go on. You go first. It's always ladies first. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I was going to say ditto all of that. I totally, totally get what you're saying. I have had some trouble, um, though, in the past with um, conscious beings sending negative negativity. So I do always douse to find out what the vitality level is just to get a, a kind of handle on what your source is, which is, does help. And um, when stuff is bad, um, you've got to kind of apply maybe a three or four approach to the whole thing it can be because it can be awful and um even if you've got the best protection on in the world if you're sticking your head in a hornet's nest when you're dowsing you might catch the odd sting <laughs> and um i always work with the archangels um michael and um azrael and they work together to um take energies over that need to go over but most definitely, even if you've got the most effective protection on, you you only need just to not break that connection when you're dowsing to pick up something when you're leaving. And um, and if you do catch anything and you're on your own, no, um, um, do a will we'll hop, you know, do a cold shower. No, the shock of it will pull your aura in. And whatever is in your energy will come away. Um, so you could get your clients to do that if they have that. And uh, if your client would ever do that, Barry, get her to have a cold shower. No, uh, that might help um, uh, because it does shock the system and the aura comes right in when you do it. And then that leaves no energy for an attachment to um, fetch any kind of way in. And um, another good way is salt bath because they're crystals so you can have a bath in crystals then you're going to clear that out of your energy system but taking over um dark stuff's hard no um, it takes a toll you've got to kind of like have your safety net around you and 
and we all douse to see if we should and shouldn't do things but you could easily just step into it even if you've said you can do it because the universe knows somewhere along the line in your toolkit and the people that you know you can do something to unpack what you've picked up even if you didn't want to pick it up in the first place <laughs> so as Re Asriel and Machiel and the, those angels they work together and they will take they will take some heavy stuff off but some of it just um you, you need to call in help definitely <laughs> that's my perspective <laughs> Okay. I knew women would have the I knew women would have the answer to this for some reason. <laughs> the, uh... So my my take on it is um, from observation of these things. Um, it seems to me that it's the the people themselves that have gone into a dark space, which become the darkness, uh, and once they do. They're, they're more likely to attract that type of energy being or entity or they attract other things in the in the same frequency so if you, if you don't put the person back to the an appropriate frequency first it doesn't really matter what you do with what they've drawn they're just going to draw in more so getting the person back to a higher frequency Anything just leaves anyway that shouldn't be there. But yeah. where yeah. They, they they come from, um, when I was doing the uh, house energy, energy work with, house, yeah. with my son, um, we, we used to find these sort of uh, triangle within a triangle within a triangle. So we we're, were looking at plans, and that's how we drew them in. But when I went to look at them, they were uh, like a... a a pyramid portal and they're generated by a clashing of different energy lines so I, I can find those sometimes out in the countryside where you've got energy lines all um, crossing over and colliding and creating these anomalies but wherever we found one of those in someone's house it was almost always had some sort of spirit um kind of getting into the house and disrupting things so you've got the people themselves that can cause it sometimes you have portals in the house that these things can drop in um, but you can do a prayer of intents uh to clear those i don't know if anybody follows um joey corn's work he has a a prayer of intent that he uses to get rid of anything like that but the other thing is a lot of people confuse um, infrasound with dark um, entities. So I've seen people dowsing and saying, oh, there's a dark spirit here, there's a dark spirit. But what in actual fact it is, is just a, a, an earth energy coming, coming up. And because it's a, a dark energy, um, or it might not be coming up, it might be kind of sucking sucking energy out which is the the darkest one um the black because there's no energy there and people think it's some sort of spirit but it's not it is just a another form of disturbance from your earth energy grid um yeah that's my take on it oh, thanks david um uh, i've got a real life situation i've been working with over the last couple of weeks um, regarding a horse up in Scotland uh, and their owner. Um, and she contacted me uh, two weeks ago <coughs> regarding the horse uh, was in a bad condition, had uh, been losing weight and uh, was, uh, you know, was uh, not, not very vital. Uh, and appeared appeared depressed almost, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when I looked into the situation regarding the horse, I always look at the 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 land that the horse is on. The land was okay for vibration. Uh, however, the horse's vibration was low. And when I started to douse into that, the the issue was an entity. 
Now, the entity, as far as I'm aware, the entity will, as David said, it matches the frequency. And what it does is, in energetic terms, it latches on to the outside of the auric field. Now, the auric field needs to keep uh, expanding. But with the heavier energy of the entity attached to the auric field, it can no longer expand. And if it's not expanding, it will start contracting. So from the point of view of an entity on, in an auric field uh, taken up by a horse, it has the effect of, of, as I say, contracting the energy and working against the, the natural flow of energy for the horse. And the relationship between the energy of the horse and the, the horse's vitality becomes compromised. Now, when I did a, a short investigation into that, that it was clear to me that the entity had actually come from the owner herself. And it was a simple matter of dissolving the entity and allowing, or in so doing, allowing the expansion of the horse's energy field to go back to its natural, uh, its natural ability, if you like. Now, as it happens, I received a, 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 a text from the lady today, uh, two weeks after I started working with the horse, and the text starts with, he seems so much, so much brighter within himself, alert and much fuller of energy. So that in itself is, is, is um, you know, it's very important what the owner's seeing, the, the horse is displaying a new vitality. And the simple, the simple response to that situation was to dissolve the entity from the auric field and to raise the vibration of the owner to the normal range. And within that, the entity can't, res can't reside within that new frequency. It's impossible because the entity itself was of a lower frequency. So there's no longer a match. So my, my take on it is always that the more we go into these things with our mind, the more problems we start to, we start to initiate. It's really important to keep our minds out of it and have a simple way of just discerning and the, the best way that I've come across within the dowsing process is just to ask the question about the vibration. When you start going into the idea of where it's from and, and the, 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 the aspect of the heaviness of it and all this sort of stuff, we, we, we're starting, it's like protection, we're starting to evoke something to be fearful about. There's no, the, 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 there's no need to go into those places. Thanks for your advice. No need. Keep out of it. Keep your mind out of it and deal with it at a vibrational level. It's all that's required. There's nothing else required. We don't need to keep, your, keep our noses out of it. There's no need for it. Thanks, Jordan, for that. Change the, vi change the vibration, the vibrational aspects, and the work's done. Change the way you look at something, and what you look at will change. Yeah, or something just, like that. Yeah, just just understand it, Barry. Understand the the the, the issue through the frequency and the vibration that it exhibits. And then use your pendulum to change the vibration. Yeah, thanks very much for that. You don't you, the, 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 you don't need to do anything else, but we can get disturbed. We can get problematic when we start looking into these things. There's no there's, there's absolutely no need to. Uh, when I first started dowsing, I at the time about eight years ago, I was a taxi driver at the time up in St Andrews. And honestly, every single day I had to go home and clear entity from my from my auric field. It was it was absolutely mind numbing. And until I realized that actually what it was about was 
it was an opportunity for me to raise my vibration. When I understood that, there's no match. There was no match. So it's all to do with the vibrational aspect of it. I was exhibiting the vibration. I was absorbing the energy from the from the people in the taxi. But when I realized what, what I was doing and my role in that, it was an opportunity for me to, to move further in my own sort of understanding. The only thing I would say to that. Yes. You've muted yourself. <laughs> Um, while we're waiting, George, can I just ask a question? When you clear something from someone's house, do you go back, or from someone, do you go back and check that it's gone? No, no, I don't. I I, I only ever check, is, is it Sarah? Sarah? Yeah, yeah, there. Sarah. No, I don't go and check because the very notion of checking something, you're evoking it again. Mm -hmm. So the, the only thing I ever do is check the level of vibration. Okay. So what if your client comes back I'll, to you and says it I'll didn't clear, work? I'll, yeah, I'll clear it and then I'll check in on the vibration. But yeah. I'm not actually giving any energy to the idea of entity because the minute you, with the minute we start to reinvoke that, we're creating it on some level. Mm-hmm. I was just going to ask as well, what happens... But the client will that do energy? that, though, won't they? What happens to that energy? You know, is it still there, going to attack some, you know, going to attach to somebody else at some stage, or is it actually dealt with finally? Well, in the... In the you may have cleared it from yourself, from, from the area, but is it still enabled to join to something else, or is it actually... No. Diffused? That was... I wondered. Just... Uh, in the in the little system that I use, whoever I don't know who spoke there, I couldn't see anybody speaking. But in the little system I use, I use a little bit of visualization, and I dissolve the the entity into the ground. So the ground, the ground, we dissipate. You dissipate the entity into the ground. Mm -hmm. I don't get that's fully dealt with, but I don't know what other people think. I worked on the site of a leprosy hospital once, and, um, and um, it was quite tricky. I didn't want to have to go back and keep checking. I'd like to think that my work works first time round. I'm an expert healer, and... Uh, I have a lot of faith in the people that are supporting me, but there was a lot on site. So you kind of like you caught one uh, and then another one will come up. It was quite a complicated site, which is why I asked about whether you go back and check. No, no. But you know what? One one approach could fix the whole thing. If you, you know, you can swoop it all up. Dep it just depends on what you've got, really, I guess. Yeah. Who was trying to talk? Someone was going to say something, weren't they? And they were muted. Rosemary talked. She had... I did say something. I did say oh, I, cool. I was wondering what happened to, to the energy after after you'd sent it out or, or dispelled it, because did that actually finally clear it or was it still around, you know, to... to cause a bit of havoc elsewhere the other thing i'll say is that i love the idea that Sir christopher used about the healing stream we tend to use that at the end when you know to finally cleanse things have the healing stream through and often flower essences we used as well to, to just make sure there's no nothing left no baggage no clean you know everything's fully cleansed dealt with 100 percent well if you could do that why not just blanket the earth and kind of cover it that way? But I think you'll find these things are always going to be there and they're always going to come in from somewhere. Um, a lot of them 
probably generated by us ourselves. Well, it's an individual approach. You know, you can't deal with everything all at once. They're all different. Which is yeah. why I say it ought to be up to the responsibility of the person to make sure their frequency is high enough so that they're not affected by them. Us clearing them away just clears away the ones in the immediate vicinity and then more will pop in. And if that person it then doesn't have a sufficient vibrational energy to keep them off, they're just going to attach again. Yeah, then that, that's a question of personal responsibility for the individuals, which I agree is very important. You know, we can, we can try and help them, but ultimately everyone's responsible for themselves and everyone's on their own individual journey. And, you know, we can raise other people's vibration, but it's up to them to keep themselves clean and, and clear after, you know, help them to, to move on, really, to grow. You can temporarily change people's vibrations but if they go back into their old cycle their old habits their old mm. uh thoughts yeah. processes yeah. they'll just go down again yeah agree but one thing with um elementals um just say they're a, they're a darker energy they're a lower energy so they're kind of browns and reds and oranges uh, and I attack them if I see them in the nicest possible way by making them electric blue, <laughs> which is, <laughs> yeah, it's raising the vibration and they just run. I see them disappearing down little holes inside of trees. and, and <laughs> um, But yeah, I, I watch them as it's happening. It's, they just stay away from me. I've been attacked once or twice, but then I figured out how to do that, and never since. All I ever really see now is the tail end of them as they keep out of the way. It's yeah, so it sets up to us to make sure our energy is high enough so that we're not affected by them. Yeah. Thing is, though, we know stuff. Now a lot of people don't. So if you're a healer, you have to kind of like just keep doing the work. And if you, you've you got a client who's taken stuff like ecstasy, it kind of like wrecks the aura and they've got no kind of protection or they've got very weakened auric systems and or some um, medical treatments do the same. You know, they if something's affected your physicality it can affect your auric system and its integrity so, Absolutely. so there will always be people that need help and it's not always their fault in, to my mind might not be their fault but it's their responsibility to get it right yeah and then how, I... how far do you take it as i mean i i don't class myself as a healer i just Put myself under the bracket of teacher um because yeah i could go around and change anybody's energy to a higher frequency unless they're higher than mine already um and i have done just just sometimes so that they can actually feel the difference and then after that i say yeah you can feel like that or you can go back to how you want up to you i said i'm not going to run around after you um you know, I think as a that's your choice. I, I think within within he, the you know when you're working with vibrational aspects, um, as you say, David, you can change the vibration quite easily, and the person will feel the difference. And there is a potential to go back into old patterns. So it's it's then important that. Uh, that perhaps there's a su support aspect for the individual and that they that they begin to recognize, because they'll only do that through experience, begin to recognize the things that bring their energy back down, vibrationally speaking. And that could be as something as, a, as, as it could be a, a, an environment that they're putting themselves into. Yep. It could be a television program they're watching. It, it, yes, it could be a relationship they're in. It could be yeah. anything, anything. So, yeah. 
So giving people a little bit of support and guidance with that and letting them feel the difference between the vibrational aspects becomes, well, it becomes an awareness thing for the individual. And then they have the choice. They've got, when they know how their energy is responding to certain things, then they have, they can discern from that. They can make the choice, well, do I watch that or do I, do I, you know, do I remove myself from that? So it's, it's just through, uh, I suppose, through an awareness. Uh, but we can we can certainly play a role in supporting that and, and feeding back information to them, which is very helpful to them, I think. Absolutely, which is why I teach energy viewing, because then they can see the mess they're making of themselves. But... Yeah, that's an important so, aspect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, 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 you know, there's so much that can alter. I mean, we're, we're, we're all very uh, sensitive to things. We all have a high sense. Well, some of us have more sensitivity, some of, but we're all potentially sensitive to, you know, a, a great deal of things, be it earth energies, be it environmental energies. You know, there's foods, there's people. Uh, and so finding finding what's affecting your own vibration can be quite a challenge and uh, you know and, and we're all unique uh, so it's not a one fits all it's a one fits all sort of a uh, jacket if you like so it's a, it can be an interesting it can be an interesting journey supporting somebody finding out about uh, you know aspects and one of the biggest things with the with the uh, you know, for people vibrationally, was is the bed that they sleep in. You know, check the bed remotely. Check the, the you know the bed, the vibration of the bed. People spend eight or nine hours a night in their bed. Now, if that bed is of a vibration which is out with the frequency, then people people calibrate to that frequency. So. If we're yeah. altering the vibration of, of an individual, yet they're putting themselves back into a vibration for eight hours a night of a bed, which is in, in the low vibration, then they'll naturally calibrate back to that level. So having a, an understanding of, of their environment becomes, becomes a vital approach. And with horses, it's exactly the same. I had a circumstance with a, a couple of years ago with a horse, and there was a... Uh, there was a lady uh, up in Fife, she had a, a stable, she had 16 stables, and she took me around the stables and she was telling me one or two pr issues, and there was one stable she came to and there was a horse in the stable, and she says, oh, this horse isn't very well at the moment, and she said, funny enough, the horse that was in it before it became unwell. And that, to me, was a, a, a red light, a major light that she was able to, she had the awareness, but she didn't understand the relationship. And when I doused into the aspect that the stable itself was low in it, in, in, in vibration. And when I looked into that through dowsing, actually on site, what it was was in that particular stable, a very simple thing was a drain there was a drain running out of the stable and that was having the effect on the vibrational aspect for the horse. Now the horse was being, the horse was being stabled in there seven, eight hours a day. So it was calibrating back to the level of vibration, which was in the environment created by the drain. Was there a sound coming up out of the, the drain? I didn't hear a sound, David. Oh, be it um, um, below our hearing range. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't aware of a sound. Okay. But I can relate to that. Sorry to interrupt. I've heard very low frequency frequency sounds coming up drain pipes, and I think they can have an effect on horses. Are particularly sensitive to vibrations because they're prey animals. And uh, one of the ways that they sense prey is through a sense of a vibration through their feet as well as through their hearing. And I think they can hear a much wider range of sound than we can. So it could be that low frequency sound is really upsetting to them. It's just yeah, sort of that's, a, that's a good point, Mary. And another, another particular situation I've been working with just recently in, 
in uh, Whitehaven in Cumbria is another stables and the the stables are there's eight stables and there's a there's a drain centered right in the middle of the courtyard and the herd leader of the of of those particular horses the main horse the herd the the, the, the chief if you like became unwell and my investigation again took me to the drain that was in the centre of the courtyard. Um, and and so I've 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 put in I've been tracking well I've been tracking I've been vi I've been checking in on the on the vibration of the courtyard and the drain over the last number of weeks. And as the as the courtyard the vibration remains normal the horse's response has it's recovered from the the issues it was dealing with so uh, the horses are uh, what you say is 100 percent correct the horses are really sensitive to their environment and to any change and any disturbance <laughs> of the of, of, of the frequency and vibration within that environment so were you looking at a disturbance in the hertz range between one and 20 it was in the. It was using the biometer, uh, David. Oh, right. Uh, so uh, on visiting the site, on visiting the site, I I worked with the horse on a one to one basis, as I've learnt to do. Uh, but I then turned my attention to the environment, and I very much uh, in my hands felt the pressure around the drain. And that led me to looking at the aspect of the drain and and what was going on vibrationally with the drain, and in resolving the in resolving that frequency around the drain, the horses the the, the horse appears to have got better. Yep, it affects people like that as well, not just horses. No, uh, exactly. No, I'm 100%. Horses, as uh, Mary said, horses are really sensitive to these things, though. Uh, and, you know, the, the instinct, the instinctive animals, intuitive animals. And, uh, you know, people think they're complicated. They're not complicated. They're just sensitive, sensitive to things going on in their environment, and they respond to that. So if we can understand their environment, and what's going on there for them, then we're in a really good position to help them. One of the other big things I've been working with recently with horses are to do with rubber mats people put down in the stable yard of horses. A lot of people put rubber mats down, maybe at a gateway during the winter time when there's a, when when the horses come in muddy and they're doing it to prevent the, the hooves holding the mud, if you like. But I've seen, I've, I've worked with three, three issues recently to do with horses uh, illness, and it's to do with a mixture, uh, or I call it a toxic mixture of uh, rubber mats, underground water and overhead cable line. If you've got um, rubber mats, they're not earthing properly, are they? No, exactly. So, so if there's, one, if there's other um, influences, they're not going to be able to earth any of that away. So yeah. it's going to be a, a double whammy for them. Yeah, that's one yeah. of the big. That's one of the big things with 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 that and the, and the rubber mat. Yeah, some horses are stable all the time in winter on rubber mats in stables, and they get I, unsettled because they can't earth themselves. Yeah. Really, not yeah. very kind at all. It, people do it because it saves bedding. You see, yeah, you don't need as much bed, but I think it's horrible. They're, I think that horses in general are kept in stables far too much because people like the horses to look nice and they like to keep them clipped. And of course, when you clip them, you've got to either rub them up or keep them inside more or both. And uh, I think more natural keeping of horses. Um, is beneficial to them, like it is for, you know, not, not healthy for any mammal to be kept cooped up indoors all the time. Yeah, no, I, 
I, I can well, no, with, I, I can sorry. I can sorry David I I concur with that that whole aspect uh, that you know the the they're a herd animal and the being out in their environment is important to them uh, and you know they don't like to be fenced in they don't like to they 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 they, they like to have that ability to roam and I know that's not possible uh, generally but. Uh, Keeping them keeping them locked up like that is certainly something that uh, that is 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 important. One of one of the what or uh, can influence the the their energetic. The 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 situation I spoke about in Whitehaven, the lady who owned the horses, she's actually a barefoot trimmer. So she she travels around the country and she'll not shoe the horses. So she's working, and it's it's all to do with this idea of the connection to the earth through the the the, the hoof, and uh, and and taking in energy uh, to nourish the nourish the energetic system of the horse. So there's this whole idea around horses at the moment as regards to the you know the shoeing of the horse, um, and that of course the metal involved in that and the energetic of the metal. Um, of of the shoe is is quite uh, quite an interesting aspect, certainly to 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 be aware of. Have they thought about using copper instead of steel for the shoes? Uh, that I don't know, David, but that might be something that would be. I, but I, I, th I think I think from the point of view of the the lady I've I've been I've been working mm. with, uh, you know. Their their whole take on it is taking it back to its natural state or natural environment to the best of its uh, you know so if the horse is out in the wild it, it ain't gonna have a copper shoe on or a steel shoe if you know what I mean. Well, if it's in the wild, it doesn't need one. It's only when they start um, taking them on the road a lot that they really need shoes. Yeah. Um, so I had a couple of horses in a different life quite a few years ago, um, uh, and they had stabling that they could come in and out of and a, a couple of acre paddock that they just kind of roamed into yeah um but the problem with that was in the spring one of them um the slightest sniff of spring grass and he'd get laminitis <laughs> it was you know uh, yeah. there's, there's a, a bit of a, a catch to everything whichever way you go yeah um you know, the originally <clears throat> horses in the Middle East were shoed in bronze. This is before the Iron Age. <clears throat> and the Smiths who who made um who made horseshoes um are almost viewed as traditionally as magicians or sorcerers. You know, they had a very special um situation and Smiths were be able supposed to be able to um Put on or lift curses. They had the power to work with iron, um, and particularly in some uh, Middle Euro European countries and amongst the gypsy community, um, uh, shoers of horses have a, a very high status um, because of this uh, this connection with the power of the horse with the power of iron. It's really interesting to, into that sort of thing. You say the power of iron, but did you not say that they used bronze originally? Originally, but as soon as people um, uh, discovered how to make iron, they shod the horses with iron, but originally... But that, that has a different effect. I mean, there's, there's a lot of research being done about um, not using iron plows or forks or spades because it um, disrupts the electrical... Um, yeah, the charge um, of the earth. So it, yeah, Rudolf Steiner um, thing about there is a big energetic difference between yeah. um, using um, iron and bronze tools. I I use a bronze spade, and I find it very successful. Hmm. A bronze what, Mary? Bronze spade. They're made in. Um, Austria by a company called Implementations that make tools for biodynamic gardeners and they do all sorts of other things for biodynamic gardening as well. Um, and 
And and what's what what do you what's what do you find is the uh, is the biggest difference with that then using that uh, that bronze speed? Um, well, I mean, I've not got any scientific data from my own use that you get less problems with mollusks and nematodes if, if you use bronze implements than if you use other sorts, and they're less fatiguing for the for the gardener. Right. I can do a lot more digging with a bronze spade, not only because the design's excellent, it's ergonomically designed and it stays very sharp, right. um, but I think it's something to do with the material that you, you don't feel the same amount of fatigue as using iron tools. That's interesting. Mm. So I'm fairly sure it's to do with it disrupting the electrical charge of the earth. Mm. But I'd, I'd have to, to to go back into <laughs> into that research somewhere. You'll probably find it on the internet. Just look up bronze spades and forks, and it'll probably give you a a reason as to why. I but think it, if you look on biodynamic sorts places, there's an absolute wealth of information. The yeah. trouble is, we've only got this present lifetime. <laughs> You could stay up all night reading this stuff and you'd never get to a tenth of it, would you? There's so much. Well, I, I did read it 100 years ago, but then I haven't dug the garden since. So I've kind of, you know, forgotten yeah. most of it. <laughs> yeah. There are some operations you need a spade for, you know, transplanting and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's burying the dead wives and all that, you know. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>